all started with him. When it came to his aspirations as an artist, whether it was making an album or a film or a video, the initial conversations were with Cavallo, Ruffalo, and Farinoli. It, without them, it never would have been a Purple Rain movie. It was their relationship with the heads of Warner Records that convinced Warner Films and get the money to make the movie. They had to find some film company to be willing to back it. Top of the line management, work with Prince. Those guys were very focused on Prince. Pulled a movie out of the hat. I mean, there was a lot of major stuff that they did. Prince was building an empire. It was making a lot of money for a lot of people. We were on location for the three months of the shooting in the south of France. You know, there was just that point in time where whenever he moved, I moved with him. There was a valet, there was a chef, and there was me. And I was like the road manager. And even if it wasn't a tour, I was still managing his moves in, in and out to hotels and clubs and whatever. Claire Fisher did the orchestration. It was just gorgeous. There were some funny scenes with Jerome and Prince. We did a lot of improv, but we, we stayed close to the script. Last minute, print it out and bring it to us. That's what yeah. we're doing. Those were Prince-written lines. That was actually a real scenario at rehearsal. Original time band. When we were first starting out, we were in a dungeon in southeast Minneapolis over by the University of Minnesota. And I wasn't in the band at the time. I was a roadie. And the band was rehearsing in this basement in the bottom of this warehouse. We were rehearsing and going through a song, and something started flickering around the room. I was sitting in the corner. I said, it's a bat! Dipped down to about knee height and ran out the room, up the stairs, and out the building. Yeah, that was a real scene. After shooting, you'd go to a screening room and see rough cuts of what had been shot the day before. The dailies. You didn't have any way to get any big picture of what the movie was going to end up being. You don't shoot it in sequence. One day you would be seeing a scene from the beginning of the movie. The next day you'd see a scene from the end. Next day you'd see a scene from the middle. It was a really daring idea. Okay, this is going to be a stretch. It's going to require a really good editor. We had we had been in Europe. We had been in the south of France. We'd been gone such a long time. He couldn't wait to get home. Throughout human history, we've had these stories about myth and archetypes, and it always involves the hero. The hero is usually a young man. He's plucked out of his environment against his will. He's usually at home minding his own business. He's plucked out of his home and he's told, you're the chosen one. You've got to go on this journey. And the journey's going to be really dangerous and you might get killed. Oh, and you got to, you know, throw the ring into the volcano or the dragon's mouth or whatever it is you're supposed to do. And no one can do it but you and no one can do it for you. And there'll be some advisors, elder people or um, goddesses or whatever who can help you and they'll heal your wounds. Maybe they'll show you the map, but no one can do this but you. So you go on this hero's journey and you bell the dragon or whatever you're supposed to do and you turn around and at some point there's a home coming. You come home, but you realize you're so damaged from the journey that you're not the person you were when you left. When I came back from Europe, my whole world was just crumbling. It, it was in disarray. I didn't even know where to pick up the piece. And then, so there was a lot of financial stuff that went down. I couldn't pull it back together, it was impossible. They were looking to blame somebody. Maserati was the first Paisley Park band, never given the viability that a band yes. should have had. I was blaming them for drinking too much and just tearing up hotel rooms, and, and they were blaming me for not watching out for them. I mean, it just went back and forth. You know, I was now a writer, a producer. I, I had written for Atlantic, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, Motown, you know, Solar. Because yeah, Maserati originally was Mark. He put it together in case Prince didn't work out. It worked out. We all know about Mickey Free. It was Mark's idea, asked me to join Maserati. I was like in 85 or something like that. So I came out and jammed with everybody and, and it was dope. And we was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be in Maserati. Mm. So I went back to LA and me and Prince are sitting across from a table. Dick Grissy's sitting with me. Prince and John Branca are sitting across from there. Contracts are on the table, ready to sign. I'm gonna sign the Paisley Park. John Branca says, okay, well, Mickey, we're ready to go. Let's do it. Dick Griffey looked at Prince and went, I ain't fat enough. No frogs for no snakes. <laughs> and then Prince looked at me, you know that one Prince, look where he goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and walked out just like oh. that. Dick Griffey wouldn't let me out of my contract. Me and Lisa were like, come, you know, do this and produce this record and do this. And that. I don't know who instigated it, but someone said. We hear rumors that the revolution may be recording an album of its own. I don't know. It, it'll be too strange. <laughs> they, they're very talented people, but they're, and together we're, so I'd rather stay here than. Freddie was a massive fan of Prince. Oh, he was a massive fan. That's how I got the job. It was not one of my favorite parts of my career. I've had this opportunity to come to me with Queen. Freddie was attracted to him in his androgyny and all that stuff. And I was very fascinated by him. There's not a lot of true rock stars that have ever existed in this world. Freddie was one of them, as well as Prince. I was jumping between both things. The Queen thing was the straw that broke the camel's back. They want me to design the tour and go out and operate it, but I can only do it if I do the whole tour. So I called Farnoli. Stephen said, well, you know, that's cool, because Prince is he's, you know, he's recording, he's not doing anything right now. So, you know, absolutely, you're free to go. The Queen shows, they had a very distinctive style. Freddie was into the theatrics of it. Big blocks of color. All the lights could change. They had multiple choices of colors on them. And it would just allow me to make these big blasts of color and, and, and add a lot more power to things. We made the deal. And then shortly after, I get a phone call. Roy, you have to fly out to Los Angeles now. You'd be in L.A. to record, and suddenly you would say, call Levi, call Sheila, call Eric, call Wendy. I want to jam tonight. The Christmas, this was Christmas in 1985. Alan called me and said he wants you out in L.A. tomorrow. So he just needs you for a couple of days. Fly out there, do what he needs you to do, and then fly home for the rest of the holidays. Grab my horn, jump down a plane. For the next few weeks, I was out in L.A. with Prince, doing a lot of jam sessions. So he had other musicians. He was having fun with them. Levi, Sheila, Wendy and Lisa. He wanted to see what they could do and how badass they were. We were in the studio off and on almost every day. They were the cool jams. And at rehearsal, we would have grooves that would last literally hours. Literally hours. Sheila was around. We weren't together anymore. I was still in the band, but once we weren't together, then it didn't, it didn't matter. But mm -hmm. everyone always assumed that it's like, oh, Sheila's here. Well, we got to act a certain way. I, you could see it. It was just plain as day. I would have to tell him, those days are over. Like, I'm here because I love music. Levi Caesar, he was already a member of Sheila's band, so he was hanging around. So I spent a lot of time with him before I actually got in his band. Well, this was a good year before he became a member of Prince's band. Wendy or Lisa, uh, myself, Prince, Sheila, Levi, any combination of us would be in the studio. Prince, Sheila, Levi, and myself, you yeah. He and Sheila, they had split a good bottle of wine before we started hitting it that night. So Prince was feeling really good. Sheila E. was in his life now, and Susanna was in his life, but she wasn't going to be there much longer. It's not easy being in a relationship with him. Oh, no, no, we got along. Everybody but it might have been fault. fake from, from her side. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't, I mean, I didn't really pay any attention to it. I mean, I've recorded a lot of things. We would just jam, and we recorded everything, and that's where these, these sessions came out just jams. And he started referring to it as The Flesh, a sequenced album that was going to be called The Flesh. Like all this instrumental jazzy stuff that was all improvisational. Some amazing jazz work. The most heady tracks that the revolution recorded. The ones that we thought were too far gone. We were finishing Roadhouse Garden. I put Roadhouse Garden on the back burner. We did three tracks. I went in and finished them. Right now, nothing's really happening with it. But will it ever come out? Oh, yes. I'll give it away. You know, you know I'm not going nowhere. I'll be, I'll be right here. Crystal Ball in the Dream Factory. They were all being swirled around. At first was Dream Factory. It was Camille. It was all these different ideas. Experiment. Prince didn't like the word experiment because it sounded like you weren't finished. It was things that we would collect along the way that didn't fit on whatever album we were doing at the time. He thought a lot about the songs to give to the world. I wonder if there was some paranoia that the thought would go away if he didn't get it down. A lot of what Prince would be excited about on Monday, nothing to do with what we were doing on Tuesday. You know, like most creative people, he would change his mind. But until he would change his mind, it was a serious project. There was never a specific, like, we're going to make the Dream Factory album now. In Dream Factory, there was even an album cover designed. 
stopped. The music just kept coming. And I don't think he could stop it. It, it was some other force. That was all done during rehearsals for the Hit and Run Tour. There's a guy named Roy Bennett, who was the production design for all of these tours. He did all the lights for the Hit and Run Tour. This is the guy who would actually design the stage. The theatrical and the visual aspect of Prince's tours were because of this guy, Roy Bennett. He really got his start with Prince. All of that stuff that you saw on stage, this was, this was because of this guy, Roy Bennett. And he's, he's been one of the most highly in-demand production designers in entertainment. And I'd worked with other artists when he wasn't doing anything, cause, and he didn't like it. He was very possessive of a lot of people. He, I was one of them. And I explained to him, I said, I'm using these opportunities to work on concepts and different ideas that I've got. It's just me working things out. Or come back and use with us. But he understood. He understood that it was important because it would just broaden my creative abilities and he begrudgingly let me go out. They approached me to design the tour under the premise that I would go out and operate the entire tour. When I flew out to Los Angeles, he was pissed. I went into the office and I was talking to Bob Cavallo and Steven. It got really heavy. There's two ways you can go on this job. And I was told that under no circumstances was I going to go out and do tour. My way or the highway. And I, you know, I obviously explained. I said, well, you know I committed to this. And they said, we don't care. You're not going to do it. Do you understand? And I, oh. Now what's it going to be, Mr. Pink? I know what that means. <laughs> I value yeah. my life. The next thing I know, the door opens in, in Bob's office, and Prince walks in, and he looks at me, and he goes, what's the name of Queen's single? Prince of the Universe? And he laughs, <laughs> walks out, slams the door, and that was it. Bob oh, looks at me, and he the message. He's basically saying, you work for me, bitch. I'm more important than them. So I just feel bad that I just wasn't able to do the tour with Queen. Fortunately, they understood the whole situation. So I ended up still designing it. I went over for rehearsals and I took that creative thought into the parade tour. Let's go to work. We were getting ready to go and do the parade tour. Billy Sparks kept everything lively. Billy was a character. Billy's a character. Prince took a liking to him. The promoter by trade and had been with Prince since the controversy tours, who would go to all the radio stations and hype the shows. Detroit, they had this component called Mojo. He played our stuff, accepted us, he embraced us. It was like, wow, he wow, really, really likes, likes us. us. We, we always do the Midnight Funk Association. The MFA. If you're in your car right now, honk your horn. I think I already hear you. Get close to a microphone. If you're in bed, get ready to dance on your back. If you're in water, get ready to make waves. We are rocking it. We are rocking it. Billy Sparks. What's happening, Billy? Everything's cool, Mo. Uh, this is Billy Sparks. The owner of Fifth Avenue from the movie Purple Rain. Every year, Prince has a birthday party in Minneapolis. He just told me this time he wanted to take his birthday on the road, do the birthday in Detroit, which is the city that made Prince number one. We'd like to thank the people who came out this morning, stood in line to buy tickets to Prince's birthday. Detroit, number one city for Prince, always has, always will be. Billy, the rumor has been going around that another show is going to be on Friday night. And we've been announcing that, so has a number of other radio stations. However, you are the ultimate source. One radio station says it's going to be at Joe Lewis, then another back at Cobo, then another one said Pine Knob. You know, it's just going wild. I just thought that I would come in to hush all the rumors. This is the official word. It was such an overwhelming response. And to be real honest with you, past our wildest imagination. So we talked to Prince today and we told him, like, show sold out in less than an hour. He has agreed to do another show, a Friday special show at 8 p.m. at Masonic. Tickets going to sell tomorrow at Masonic Temple Box Office all Ticket World locations, but not including Hudson. Because of the overwhelming response, we're going to keep it down to a two-ticket minimum per person. That way, you know, hopefully everyone who wants to go to the show can see the show. And again, from Prince, uh, this is not no cheap hype or game we were playing with the people of Detroit. All right, well, look here. We appreciate you coming down, giving us the official word. And also, Mo, since you have been our number one man here really looking out for us, I'd like to give you four tickets for Saturday night sold-out birthday show at Cobo Hall. Oh, this radio this station radio did not want to carry around, around rumors. rumors. You don't want to carry we, around we, 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 we felt like uh, we would get Billy, Billy 
Billy Sparks in here, and Billy Sparks uh, is the word on person in Detroit. You definitely have the official word. Get him a limo mo, bring him in first class style, then go to the concert, we'll get him backstage passes. Recently we played live in Detroit, and we toured the stage here. Because Detroit has been good to Prince, and we wanted to give some back. It was our duty to come and do what we did. We rehearsed for it, but we came to tear it up. He decided to straighten his hair back and put on suits and, you know, the bikini underwear and the trench coats were gone and it was like, oh shit, Prince grew up. In some respects, I'm the same person. I don't dress the same though. I don't look the same. I, um, I did that for a specific reason. He said, I showed up at his house in a blizzard, no socks on. He didn't even catch on, you know. Uh, I got the money. <laughs> And you got the coke. <laughs> I got some drugs. <laughs> he was like, it's my mind. You can't have it. You get a little bit what I want you to have. He's a very complicated person, man. He isn't going to make any attempt to even his moves. When he was done with you, he was done. It was the best tour we'd had, and it was more musical than ever. And the, the revolution knew when Prince put Wally and the three guys in the parade tour, Wally, Brooks, and Jerome, when those guys were at the front of the stage, we were like, it's a sea change, folks. It's really about the music. Nico was one of the best rhythm guitar players in the history of the music. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. You know, referring to this guy, Matt, we already got a Matt. Uh, give him a name. You're, you're living in Atlanta. Take the name Bliston. Hey, you're Atlanta Bliss. There were a lot of songs that, that didn't have horns on the recorded version. He would ask me to come up with an arrangement, or sometimes we just sit there and we throw some ideas against the wall and see what's what, what stuck. When I'm involved in it, it's go. I'm outside my body. That's what a performance is for me. You know, doing all the, uh, the choreography and where people had to be on stage and where they were supposed to go and do and back and forth on that huge stage, that got crazy. We all seemed to get along okay. There was never any conflict with any of the new people. It, was, it wasn't a bad thing by any means. It certainly was fun. Performing with Prince and the band. I'm a fan on stage. I have the best seat. He looked to our relationship to keep him grounded. Get this sense of privilege. That's the wealth and celebrity. We had a chance to work on Kiss. We were like, nah, we ain't gonna do this song. But it was free studio time. Why not work on it? And when we came back the next morning, it was so good he took it back. It was ugly. Uh, during the tour, it was non-stop playing. We had a blast. Then playing the after parties. If you went to him and say, Prince, we won't have any gear because all the gear is going on the trucks to the next town. They won't have time to get to the next venue if they stay back and do an after show till four in the morning. You don't want to hear it. The first time that happened, he was like, okay, we need a van with a duplicate set of gear for after shows. So now in the middle of the tour, we're trying to find a van with a trustworthy driver and buy a new set of gear in the event we wanted to do an after show and we couldn't use the tour gear. It was like, I don't care, whatever it takes, make it happen. And it was outright obsessive. It felt like something was going on. 
There was no doubt in my mind that Sheila was going to be the drummer in the band. It was an after concert birthday party for Prince, and we'll kick in four very special passes for the Prince's personal birthday party, which will be at a secret location. No other station will know this location. I'm going to tell you that right now. Mo, you got it. Take care of it. Thank you, Detroit, and may God bless you. Well, let me ask you, will they get a chance to meet Prince? Prince will be there. Prince will be there.